Hello everyone. Welcome to a new Learn and Share session. I'm Vivian Placencia and today we have Roman who will be talking about large scale MPC scaling private iris code uniqueness checks to million of users. So as usual, you can write the questions in the chat and Roman will answer all of them at the end of the presentation. You can also unmute yourself at the end of the presentation to ask questions. And welcome, Roman, and thank you so much for being here. And the floor is yours. Feel free to start whenever you want. Um, hello from my side as well. Thanks for having me. So this is a, a, a about the project that we have uh, that they have been doing the last months together with WorldCoin to solve some of their privacy problems. And the mainly involved people are Renko and Philip from WorldCoin and Daniel and me from Tatseo. So this talk will be uh, structured uh, as follows. So first, I will start with an introduction about the problem that we want to solve. And then we give the actual protocol, which we want to translate into the privacy preserving setting of secure multi-party computation. Then I will talk a little bit about the basics of MPC. So we will all be at the same page after these uh, few slides. And then I will talk about our main techniques that make this uh, MPC application efficient. And I will give you um, some concrete instantiations of the protocol. And finally, I will talk a little bit about the implementation and benchmarks and a small conclusion about this um, project here. So let's start with the introduction. So um, this talk is, or this project is an application of um, secure multi-party computation. And if I would have to um, describe MPC with just one sentence, it would be that MPC allows mutual untrusting parties to compute a function on a combined private input without the requirement of sharing these inputs with each other. So the inputs actually stay private. And MPC has been uh, researched in the last decade heavily in academia, and it's a very flexible technology where we have uh, tons of different protocols. We can instantiate MPC with different security levels. For example, the semi-honest security level where the protocol is considered secure as long as everybody honestly follows the protocol. But we can also have a malicious security setting where we detect the, if other parties actually deviate from the protocol or send malicious messages or similar. But in this talk, we will mainly focus on the semi-honest setting to get more performance out of the whole, uh, whole, whole MPC protocol. So MPC is uh, in some sense quite similar to FHE, so fully homomorphic encryption and zero knowledge in that sense that it can be actually applied to uh, tons of different use cases to enhance privacy. And examples in academia, you often see um, new MPC protocols applied to machine learning or data analysis. In the web free infrastructure, you have seen MPC applied to threshold signatures and threshold wallets. And in this project, we will actually use MPC to decentralize the data database to bring more privacy to a given database. And in this project, we apply MPC to the World ID infrastructure. So I will talk a little bit about what World ID actually is. So this is something that is uh, um, hosted by uh, WorldCoin. And what they want to achieve with World ID is to bring a unique identifier to humans to the internet. You can then later use this identifier to authenticate for different services, for example, also with zero knowledge proofs. But um, in, we mainly look here at the setup phase of this, um, of this word ID infrastructure. So we are not concerned with zero knowledge in this talk at all. So and what they want to achieve with this unique identifier is that it's only possible for humans to sign up. So no AI models um, and no spam or et cetera. And it should only be possible for humans to sign up exactly once. And they enforce this with a storing um, and biometric information of all signed up individuals in a database. So in the setup phase, what you have to do is you have to go to this uh, to a specific op station. So they call this op station. You see um, an op here on the slides. And what this op does is it scans your eye and derives some so-called iris code from your image of the eye, sends it to a server, and then your iris code is actually checked against this uh, server of um, uh, already registered iris codes. And if you're already present in this database, then you get rejected. And the, this iris code is actually only used during the setup phase. But unfortunately, this requires that WorldCoin, uh, at least previously, uh, WorldCoin had to store this, uh, all this uh, biometric information in a database. And this has um, huge privacy implications. On one hand, it's a database of biometric information. So that uh, alone is something that we, it's not um, 
um, it's not um, well seen also by privacy regulators, but it also allows for potential misuse. For example, you could derive potentially uh, uh, information about the humans from these iris codes, let's say um, what color the iris have been, or you can use this uh, database to sign up for different um, uh, services, um, which also use iris codes. Uh, if you also con uh, control one single server, with this, uh, if you're the one controlling this server, you can also um, uh, deny giving out IDs to some uh, individuals. So censorship is also a problem there. So you can see there's a lot of privacy implications if you have this single database here. And in this project, we want to, to, um, to, um, to, to change this privacy implication by applying uh, MPC to split this database amongst multiple mutual um, uh, in distrust and parties here. So the setup will be the following here. So you can see this on the on the slide. We suddenly have um, uh, after applying NPC, we suddenly have multiple parties here, and each of these parties have a so-called secret share of this uh, of the database. So the, these shares on their own do not contain any information. So no party knows anything about the iris codes which are stored in the database. But uh, if they would collude, they could again reconstruct the whole database from these shares. And also, when we um, um, want a new human to sign up for the service, they all actually also secret shares the iris to the new uh, to these uh, database holders. And so, none of these database holders get any information about the new iris code uh, which wants to sign up to the service here. So, um, no party on its own learns anything. But since we have um, secret shares of all the data, we can use MPC protocols to actually check whether this new iris is contained in this distributed database or not. So this is the whole setup that we are aiming for in this, uh, in this project here. So this sounds very nice, but unfortunately, similar to zero knowledge or homomorphic encryption, applying MPC to a use case usually leads to a performance uh, reduction. And we need to uh, kind of optimize the protocol to actually get a, a fast enough system in practice. So, but this uh, performance overhead that you get with MPC, this highly depends uh, again on the use case that you want to, to apply. So let's have a look at the protocol that we want to translate to an MPC application here. So in plain, what uh, is happening when you, um, when you want to compare to iris codes um, is basically the following protocol. So in practice, you not only have an iris code, which here is on the slides, the vector C, but you also have a mask, which is here, the vector M. And this mask has the intention to, to hide some faulty bits in your iris code. For example, when you uh, take a scan of your iris, there could be some eyelashes in the way, and this mask then re uh, removes these eyelashes from the matching procedure here. So we have two vectors, the iris code and the mask. And when we want to match this uh, iris code and the mask against the, the, the whole database, we basically go through the whole database and compare the new iris to each iris in the database here. And the comparison is actually done via so-called fractional hemming distance. And the, the protocol you can see here on the slides. So first we have to combine both masks, so M1 and M2, to get the, the, the combined mask, which basically says which bits we should actually consider during the, the um, the, uh, the matching here. And then we um, calculate the hemming distance, which is basically just uh, the, the XOR of the both iris codes. Um, then we apply also the, 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 the mass to this XOR of the iris codes and count how many bits are actually set uh, after this XOR operation. Then we divide this by how many bits are present in the um, comparison at all. So this is done by counting how many bits are in the combined mask. And then we um, just uh, do this comparison, hemming distance divided by mask length must be smaller than some threshold here. So this, this is a very, very simple protocol and this has also been uh, applied to many other use cases. But unfortunately, when we want to translate this protocol to MPC, this can get very inefficient very quickly. And the reason for that are the following. So first, the, the, the data sizes that are involved in this work on use case are kind of huge for MPC. So for example, one iris code has uh, already 12,800 bits and the database size um, the for, uh, um, which is uh, 
currently present that work on is uh, 6 million iris codes. So when you uh, multiply this together, you get a huge database of uh, iris code bits. And the problem with MPC is always when you uh, do a computation that um, you need to communicate for each multiplication or each end gate. And uh, the larger the amount of data is that you want to compute on, the more communication will have. And then you suddenly have so much communication that uh, this becomes the, 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 the main bottleneck of your application here. Yeah. So you need these computing parties, they need to exchange gigabytes or terabytes of data if we are not um, uh, efficient here. So the second problem with this um, uh, with this uh, protocol here is that we uh, um, ideally want to compute over different domains. So first for the Hamming distance, so we can see it on a slide before here. So we, we first want to uh, perform an EXA operation, which is uh, obviously for the Boolean domain. And then for the discount once operation, we ideally want to do this over a larger, uh, a larger ring. So in our case, this will be 16-bit integers. And afterwards, when we want to, to compare um, the, 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 so that the, when we want to do the comparison, HD divided by ML smaller D, that we again kind of want to do over the Boolean domain because that's the, basically the only efficient way we can do comparisons in MPC. So we need to go from Boolean to a larger ring to again to Boolean. So this can also become very inefficient very quickly. And just to give you some uh, comparison, there is a, a, a paper in the academic literature, it's called Janus, and they basically try to achieve the same just for different uh, um, organizations, so that they wanted to do iris code matching for the Red Cross for um, uh, human aid distributions, and uh, they achieve a throughput for the MPC protocol for, for about 2,000 iris code comparison per minute. So this is very, very slow, especially when we consider that the current database size of work is about 6 million iris codes. So we need to come up with something better here. But before I talk about what we actually did to make this protocol efficient, I want to first introduce um, some basic MPC protocols that we have been using in this project. So um, let's start with um, additive secret sharing. So what I said, well, what we want to do with MPC is we basically want to, to split some data into random shares. You can see it here on the, on the right side here. So we want to split X to random shares, X1, X2, and X3, such that none of these shares can, um, give you any information about the original value X. And then we want to be able to compute on these shares. And after we reconstruct them, we want to give the, the, the ring result. And a very simple but very powerful protocol is uh, additive secret sharing. And how this works basically is, so let's say we have n parties. What we do is when we want to share value x, we, we sample n minus one random values and construct the last share xn to be the, the real value x minus the sum of these uh, random elements here. So that basically tells us that um, each party gets one random element. And when we combine them together via the sum operation, we are able to reconstruct the original secret here. So this is a very simple but very powerful technique. So let's see what the properties we actually get by doing this, uh, this additive secret sharing. So basically, since all of these elements are randomly sampled, um, and we need all of these uh, elements to actually reconstruct the secret. That means that even if uh, I have n minus one shares, I can get no information about the original secret. So I need all of the shares together to reconstruct x from the, from the shares. So this is a very nice property. Also, that the scheme is linear. This also gives us very nice property. Properties, and that is that every linear operation that I can apply on the shares leads to a valid share of the result. So that basically means if I want to add two shares together or add a share with a constant, multiply a share with a constant, then I can do this locally on my share without interacting with the other computing parties. So there's a lot uh, of things that I can do without actually uh, talking to the other computing parties here, which is very nice. But the only problem that we have with additive secret sharing is that when I have two shared values and I want to multiply them, then I cannot do this locally because this is not a linear operation. And there I actually have to do some uh, interaction with the other parties. And the, the, how we would do that, that there are several different methods, but uh, we will see one on the, on the next slide here. Okay, um, then another 
MPC protocol is a so-called three-party replicated sharing. And uh, that is one that we actually will use in the, this project here. And the essence of this um, protocol is that, um, uh, as it says in the name, we only have three computing parties. And uh, we basically do additive sharing of a value. So if we have here the value X, we produce three additive shares. But the twist of replicated sharing is that uh, each party now has not only one share, but two shares. So party one would have the share X1 and X3 in this case. So each party has two shares. So why would we do that? So first, uh, uh, what we get uh, since we are using additive secret sharing, we inherit the same property that we can uh, compute linear functions on our shares without party interaction. So this is something that we basically just inherit from additive secret sharing, which is very nice. Another property what we get is that um, since we now have two shares per party and there is uh, only a total of three shares, we basically just need the contribution of two parties to reconstruct the secret. And it doesn't matter which of these, um, uh, uh, which two out of these three parties there are, um, any set of two parties can reconstruct the secret. So this is a setting which we call honest majority in the, in the academic literature. And it's something we have to keep in mind. But a very nice property of this replicated sharing is that we now have a, um, a native uh, multiplication protocol. And that is, since I have two shares, I can use this formula here that I have on the slides to actually compute an additive share of the multiplication here. So um, I can translate um, a replicated sharing in a multiplication to an additive sharing without party interaction. So the only interaction that I will have um, for a multiplication here is when I want to uh, translate this uh, additive shared result to a replicated sharing again. And that I can do by simply sending my share to the next part, and then I have again a replicated sharing. But it is the whole advantage of this replication here is that I have a very simple multiplication protocol. And that is uh, also one of the main things why we will use replicated sharing in our protocol. Another very important uh, optimization of replicated sharing is that is also important for this project here is that when I have a dot product in my protocol, then I can um, compute this without um, um, very simply by first computing a local part of each multiplication and then staying in additive sharing. So I don't do any communication anymore. And when I sum up the results, I can just reshare the final result to the other party so I can get this replication again. And uh, what I get is that I can basically, basically compute the dot product where the communication is independent of the vector sizes. So I only have to communicate the final result of the dot product to, to get the replication again. So dot products can be implemented with a very reduced communication between the parties. There is a huge advantage also for replicated sharing in our setting, which we will see later why this is the case. So another very important protocol that I have to talk about is Shamir secret sharing. So this is basically a different approach to, to um, get a secret sharing here. And uh, what you can get with it is a so-called threshold sharing. So I can basically define uh, how many shares I need to, um, to successfully reconstruct the original secret. This is also one of the oldest MPC protocols that we have, but it's uh, still very, very powerful. And how do we achieve that? It's basically by working with polynomials. So when I want to share the value X, what I do is I um, randomly sample a polynomial. So uh, with randomly sample, I mean I sample coefficients A1 and uh, up to AB randomly. And then I put the value that I want to share in the constant term of the polynomial. And when uh, so this is the, the so-called sharing polynomial, and what the actual shares of in, in this MPC protocol are are just points on this polynomial. So the party one will get the polynomial evaluated at the index one, party two will get the polynomial evaluated at index two, and so on. So basically, they have points on these polynomials. And we do this um, because um, what we can do with polynomials, we can reconstruct the original polynomial from uh, t plus 1 shares. So I, I can first choose the degree of the polynomial. And then I, I know that if I have one more share, then I can reconstruct the original polynomial and therefore the original secret by Lagrange interpolation. So this is very nice. And it doesn't matter which points I have on the polynomial. It just needs to be t plus 1 
um, points here. And also, um, since we are working with polynomials, we have some very nice properties here as well. So first, um, uh, polynomials are um, also, so Shamir secret sharing is also a linear secret sharing scheme. So that basically means that similar to, um, to additive sharing, linear operations can be computed on the shares without the parties needing to communicate with each other. And also that's very nice. Uh, we have a very uh, native multiplication protocol here as well. When I have two points on, uh, on a poly uh, of two different polynomials, I can just multiply them together. And as a result, I have a point of a polynomial where also the constant term is multiplied. So basically multiplying two shares gives a valid share of the, of the actual result. But the caveat here is that uh, when I do that, the polynomial degree doubles. So basically I need twice as many parties to reconstruct the uh, original value here. So in our case, when we will use Shamir secret sharing in this project is um, we will construct basically the same setup as for replicated sharing. We will use three parties and we will choose the, um, the, the, um, the polynomial degree to be one. So that basically means we need two parties to reconstruct the original secret. So we also get this honest majority setting. And also what is very nice, in, in this um, uh, Shamir secret chain for our use case is that when we have something like, let's say, uh, a dot product or a normal multiplication, then we can um, actually translate the result to free party additive sharing by multiplying the share with the, the uh, correct Lagrange coefficients. So we basically reconstruct the share in MPC to get an additive share. So you can think about it like this. Um, and it basically also gives us the property that when I have um, Shamir sharing with n equals three and the uh, um, polynomial degree of just one, I can do a dot product. Uh, the result will be a sharing with degree two. I can translate this to a uh, three party additive sharing. And then with uh, one communication round, I can again translate this to a three party replicated sharing. And again, I only need to do this for the result. And so Basically, that means I can implement a dot product where the, the communication is again independent of the vector size, which is also very nice for our use case. So, so far that was the introduction of the MPC protocols that we use in our, um, in our project here. So let's now talk a little bit about the, uh, our techniques to make actually this uh, fraction hemming distance comparison efficient with MPC. So the first and uh, probably the biggest uh, optimization that we did is uh, rewriting the Hamming distance calculation because uh, the Hamming distance, uh, this will be the biggest factor in communication. And uh, especially when we have uh, uh, Iris code sizes of 12,800 bits. So um, reducing this communication is critical for the performance of the whole protocol. So and, um, you can see again here, the so Hamming distance between A and B is basically counting how many bits are set after I've XORed A and B together. And what we can also um, see quite easily is that um, we can rewrite this equation to uh, first summing up uh, all bits of A, so, uh, adding the sum of all bits of B and uh, subtracting twice the third product of A and B. So this is, uh, gives us the same uh, uh, result as count ones of A, X, or B. So and you can also see the only part in this formula where we actually have communication is this dot product because everything else is linear. And what we have seen on the previous slides is that when I use an honest majority protocol, so replicated sharing or Shamir secret sharing, then this dot product actually has only the communication of one multiplication here. So by applying this trick, we can drastically reduce the communication requirements of our whole protocol. And uh, this is also one of the main reasons why we can actually make it uh, efficient in practice. So what we will do in our uh, setting is, so whenever the uh, orb wants to share a new iris code to the computing parties, it shares each bit over a larger ring set D, where we choose T to such that um, the, this computation here does not overflow. And then we can um, actually compute that the, the Hamming distance via this equation here on the slide with just a dot product and uh, reduce the communication overhead to get the Hamming distance. So this is very, very nice. And this reduces the, the whole communication by this factor of 12,800 that we have for the iris post speeds. So this is very, very nice. 
But um, so what I've given here is basically just a normal hemming distance. And in our real protocol, which we have seen in the beginning, we will have a mask here as well. And then we also have a very nice optimization where we can uh, introduce this mask into this uh, computation here to reduce um, uh, performance requirements. And this is uh, what we have on this slide here. So um, the optimization that I'm talking about is that we kind of want to encode the, the iris code bit and the mask bit together in a, what we call a mask bit vector. And what we do here basically is um, when the mask is not set, we want the, the mask bit vector to be zero. And when the mask is set, we set the, the bit, uh, uh, mask bit vector to minus one if the iris code is zero, and we set it to plus one if the iris code is one. So basically here um, with this mass bit vector, uh, when we have a zero, this means the mask is zero, minus one means mask is one and the uh, iris code is zero, and uh, a, a value of one means uh, both the mask and the iris code bits are set. So why do we do that? So basically what the advantage of this is that um, we can actually rewrite this equation here uh, that we need to compute in this uh, whole protocol. So this count once of the mask hemming distance, uh, smaller than the threshold times the, 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 the length of the combined mask. The disk uh, gets reduced to just a dot product on the left-hand side and uh, a slightly updated value on the right-hand side. So we have a dot product between these mask bit vectors. On the right-hand side, we have one minus twice the threshold times the, um, the length of the combined mask here. So that basically means when we want to compute the protocol, we don't have to compute this uh, huge statement here with two sums and where we also have to introduce the mask here somehow again and the dot product, we do just one dot product here. So this is basically the simplest we can get uh, in our protocol here. So um, the CPU, we just have to compute one dot product and then the comparison, which is very, very nice in reducing the performance overhead on the CPU. So the, the next step is once we have this uh, dot product, we need to do a comparison here. And um, um, what is often done in the academic literature when we want to do a comparison of shared values, it is um, that we rewrite this to an MSB extraction. So it is actually when we uh, choose the sharing ring to be large enough such that the subtraction does not really overflow, then the comparison is equivalent to extracting the most significant bit of A minus B. And we can calculate A minus B since we are in a linear secret sharing scheme. This does not require communication. So that the only thing where we have communication here is for the MSB extraction. And there is also some uh, nice tricks in the academic literature who get the MSB quite efficiently. And these especially work well for um, pre-party replicated sharing. So this is the main reason why we also use this protocol here in this, uh, in this setting. And um, so what we basically want to achieve here is we somehow want to translate an um, arithmetic sharing, where basically we have a normal additive secret sharing where the shares summed up together give the original value. We want to translate this to a setting where we have, instead of the addition, we have the XORs of the shares, which we, uh, gives us the original value X. And once we have this setting, we can just extract one bit of it, so the MSP of it, and this is then a valid sharing of the real uh, MSP result. So that is the main procedure that we want to achieve here. And in pre-parted replicated sharing, there exists a very nice protocol that achieves this, and this works by so-called share splitting. So what you do here in this setting is that you first construct valid binary sharing, so sharing with this XOR um, reconstruction algorithm. Um, so you construct the valid binary sharings of all of these three uh, shares here. So when we want to uh, construct the valid sharing of X1, we construct it as X1, 0, 0. So you can easily see X1, X0, 0, X0 will give X1. So this is a valid binary sharing of X1 here. And um, since we have replicated sharing, this means that first party has X1 and 0, second party has 0 and um, X1, and the third party has 0 and 0. So this um, valid sharing of X1, the parties can create on their own without party interaction. So that they just take X1 if they already have X1 and set the, the um, share to 0 if they don't have it. And we do this for all of the shares here, X1, X2, and X3. So we have in the end three 
valid binary sharings of the original sharings here. And we need now uh, we now need to combine these three binary sharings to get uh, a valid share of the of the real uh, value x. And since the reconstruction procedure in, in normal, normal additive sharing is just the addition here, we can do this by computing a binary addition circuit of these uh, three binary sharings here. So we have binary sharing, so we can compute binary circuits, and we need to combine those with additions to get the original result. So we will actually compute a binary addition circuit to uh, add together the binary shares x1, x2, and x3, and the result is actually a valid binary sharing of the original value x. So by doing this, we actually can translate the, um, the additive sharing of x to a binary sharing of x, and then we can extract the MSB and we are basically done. So this works out very nicely when we work over the ring set two to the power of k, because uh, binary addition circuits naturally uh, perform this modular reduction of set two to the power of k. Um, but unfortunately, when we would work over prime fields, we need to uh, somehow introduce the um, modular reduction mod b also in the circuit here. But I won't talk too much about it since we will uh, later see that um, we can get away with not computing over prime fields here in the circuit as well. So these are basically the main techniques that we're using, um, rewriting to a dot product, optimizing it to a simpler dot product, and then doing um, MSB extraction to get the final result. So now let's talk about how we could instantiate the full protocol here. So first, as a first step, I want to talk about the protocol where we actually have this iris code secret shared, but the masks are actually known to the computing parties. So we do this here to, to make this uh, first protocol a little bit simpler, and this will be a stepping stone to actually compute the whole protocol where we um, also would hide the, the mask here. We will talk about this a little bit later here. But first, now um, we have the setting, the iris codes are shared, and the masks are public here. So basically what we want to compute here is this equation on the, uh, on the slide. So first the dot product, and we want to compare it to some um, floating point value times uh, the number of mass bit sets. So what we can do here on the right-hand side, we can, since this is all public, we can just uh, calculate uh, how many bits are set in the combined mask and um, multiply this with this real number and round it and then compute the protocol here. So in the end, it's just one dot product and an MSB extraction that we had. So when we now would use replicated sharing to compute this, so this basically means that for each bit in the iris codes in the database, we have to uh, store two shares over a larger ring. So basically we will use the ring set two to the power of 16. And so we will need 32 bits storage for each bit in the, uh, in the database. So this is kind of overhead. And when we want to perform one MPC multiplication with uh, replicated sharing, if you remember this from the slides before, we actually would perform three multiplications on the CPU and have to add these results together. But uh, we have also this very nice advantage that we can use the ring set to the power of K. As I said, we use set to the power of 16 for this very cheap MSB extract that we had on the previous slide. So on the other hand, when we would use Shamir secret sharing, um, we only have to share, uh, store one share, or one field element for each bit in the database. So basically the overhead from, uh, from the database is half compared to replicated sharing. So this is a property that we kind of want to have. But on the other hand, um, also multiplications with Shamir secret sharing is also um, one uh, multiplication on the CPU. So this is also cheaper on the CPU compared to replicated sharing. But uh, we kind of have to pay for that, uh, that within Shamir secret sharing, we usually have to work over a finite field. And that basically means that this uh, MSP extract that I had on the previous slide is more expensive since we also have to get the modular reduction in there. So ideally, ideally what we want to have is Shamir secret sharing for its reduced uh, database storage size and therefore also reduced run requirements on the server. Um, and also on the uh, for the, the cheaper um, uh, computation of the uh, of the multiplications in MPC. But on the other hand, we would love to have replicated sharing for the ability to have these um, uh, set to the power of k rings for the cheaper MSP extraction. So now I want to talk a little bit now about why we cannot use Shamir secret sharing over this set to the power of k rings. 
So as I said before, usually we have Samir, Shamir SQL sharing over a field because when we do like launch interpolation, we need to, to do some inverses. And we, as we know, we cannot really do inverses over some rings here. But with Shamir SQL sharing, this is kind of a, a special case here because uh, we can actually choose the values which we need to invert during Lagrange interpolation. interpolation. So when we, when we choose these values um, uh, right, then we can actually instantiate it over a ring um, because when we choose it right, we know that even if we are in a ring, we only invert elements which are actually invertible in this ring. But unfortunately, when I want to instantiate Shamir secret sharing over the set to the power of k rings, I cannot find enough of these points which I can, uh, which I need to be uh, to invert here. So we call this uh, exceptional points, and the requirement for the um, for it to work with uh, Shamir secret sharing Lagrange interpolation is that for all these uh, exceptional points, each pairwise difference need to be invertible. And unfortunately, when I work over the ring set two to the power of k, I only can find two exceptional points. And for three party Shamir secret sharing, you need actually four of those. So it is uh, not possible to, to get Shamir secret sharing over this ring in the setting here. But luckily, the, we can use something um, called Galois extension rings. Um, so this is also done in the academic literature several times. We can use Galois, Galois extension rings to basically not just work over a ring element, but a polynomial over the ring elements to get more of these uh, so-called exceptional points. And when we use um, this here, uh, the, um, this Galois extension ring set to the power of kx, modulus x quadrat minus x minus one, then we actually have um, two to the power of two equals four exceptional points. So we actually, when we work over this Galois extension ring, we can do free party Shamir uh, secret sharing. But um, the, the, um, the, the disadvantage of this is that now we have to compute over these Galois extension rings here. So basically every operation that we do uh, normally on a field or a ring, we now have to do over polynomials, which can become very expensive very quickly as well. But luckily, we, we have a very special setting here. And that is that we basically just use uh, Shamir secret sharing to compute a dot product. So what we can do is that in, instead of uh, just uh, backing one of these iris code bits into uh, one of these Galois ring elements, we can actually back two uh, iris code bits like uh, the, this polynomial here, a0 plus a1 times x into a Galois ring element. So it basically means that we can store two bits per Galois ring element in there. So uh, um, amortized this again means that we can uh, store um, just one bit per polynomial here. So th this is not a, not, not a problem here. And also very nicely when we, we choose um, this x to squared minus x minus one reduction polynomial here, what we can also see is that when we do a Galois ring multiplication, this actually gives us parts of the dot product that we actually want to compute. So when we embed two bits into the Galois ring element, perform a Galois ring multiplication, then a constant term of the result is actually um, the dot product of these two uh, embedded bits here. So this is very nice. And so that basically means when we want to um, use these Galois rings in our special setting where we actually want to compute the dot product, we basically just have to compute um, the constant term of this Galois ring multiplication um, uh, and we are basically done. We don't even need to compute this upper part here. So this is uh, super nice to reduce the, 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 the computational complexity by using Galois rings. But this unfortunately only works when we have to compute the dot product here. Another thing, um, when we want to translate then this uh, Shamir sharing over this Galois ring to an additive sharing, we usually uh, set in the beginning somewhere that we need to multiply it with a Lagrange coefficient. And usually in this setting, we would need to do this also over the Galois ring, so a more expensive multiplication. And there we would also require this upper term here, a0 p1 plus a1 p0 times x. But um, if we again uh, do a slight rewriting of this uh, of the of the whole procedure and multiply the Lagrange coefficient to the beginning here to a zero plus a one times x, 
then we actually can get away with just computing this constant term here. And this is then a valid additive sharing over the set to K ring um, of this uh, partial dot product here. So in this setting, we can actually use Shamir secret sharing over Galois rings at no extra cost. And um, we can also work over these set to the power K rings. So by using Shamir or Galois rings, we again get um, the, the same properties for Shamir that we just need to uh, store one 16-bit uh, element for, for the shares. We just need one multiplication for each shared bit. And we have the additional um, advantage that we can compute the MSB extract over the cheaper uh, um, set to the power of K ring. So in this setting, this is super efficient. So we will use Shamir or Galois rings. Uh, and then we can do everything over set to the power of K. So that basically advantages of replicate sharing and Shamir sharing combined. So, okay, this was the, the first protocol. And now we also want to, to hide these masks here. So, um, um, yeah, so, so not only the iris codes are shared, but also the masks are shared here. So both will be hidden from the, the, all the computing parties. So we get full privacy here. The main problem that we achieve here in the end is that um, now this right hand side is not a constant enemy. So first, um, when we share the mask as, uh, as bits, uh, the end gate is uh, count one. So the end gate is basically equivalent to a dot product. So we need an additional dot product um, uh, on the on the uh, on the compute, computation side. But the additional problem is that this uh, one minus two times D is actually a real value. And we, it's not that efficient to, uh, to do a multiplication of a real value and a shared value and round the result in MPC. So what we have to do here kinda is um, approximating this uh, value one minus two D with uh, a fraction A and B, and then rewrite the equation to B times the dot product must be greater than A times the dot product. And what we, we get here is that uh, basically since we have uh, chosen the ring set to the power of 16 such that no none of these dot products overflows, we also need to make sure that the multiplication with B also does not overflow here. So this gives us basically two trade-offs that we can work on here. First, we compute the dot products of a larger ring. So let's say set um, to the power of 32 such that the multiplication afterwards also doesn't overflow or we keep the same uh, um, ring size for the dot product and lift then the result in MPC to a larger ring before we do the multiplication with A or with B here. So and we opt to do this, this later optimization to keep the cost of the dot product as low as possible because uh, this will be the main bottleneck on the CPU in the end. So and just to give you a quick overview on how we would do then the lifting from a, a additive share of uh, um, uh, modulo 2 to the power of 16 to an additive share of modulo 2 to the power of 32. So basically the problem why we cannot really interpret the share as a share what this larger ring is that um, the reconstruction works modulo this 2 to the power of 16. So that basically means when I add do uh, value, uh, three values together, so two additions, uh, the result can have two bits too much. So basically it means uh, uh, x1 plus x2 plus x3 is the real result plus uh, um, c1 times to the power of 16 plus c2 to the power of 17, where c1 and c2 are just individual bits which can be set on. So and our strategy basically is uh, in, in this lifting procedure is um, extracting this C1 and C2 bit, uh, interpreting x to the power of 16 as a share of x to the power of two um, of two to the x modulus two to the power of 32, and uh, subtract um, the, the, these, these extracted bits here. So this is basically the main uh, goal that we want to achieve. And then we can extract this C1 and C2 very similar to uh, how we did the MSP extraction. So basically just computing this share splitting and then 18-bit binary addition circuit in MPC. So this is uh, very similar to this MSP extraction. And once we have done that, we uh, have lifted a valid sharing of the uh, modulo 2 to the power of 16 to uh, sharing mod 2 to the power of 32, exactly what we want here. And there's actually uh, one other trick that we can apply here. So for, for this uh, constants here before, this A divided by B, when we choose B to be due to the power of 16, then we actually can um, 
uh, we actually do not have to do this complicated lifting procedure because uh, multiplying a share with a constant gives us the real result modulo, um, the, the original modulus times the constant here. So this can be done for free in MPC. So we basically only have to do this lifting for, um, for one of these two dot product values. And the other one is actually free in MPC. So this is very nice. So that basically means when I have the iris codes and the mask bit shared, so I want to compute this formula here, it basically means I have to compute two dot products, one lifting step, it is here, the, this dot product on the right hand side, because the one on the left hand side is done for free when I choose B to be 2 to the power of 16, and then uh, again, one MSB extract. And then uh, basically the protocol is done. So that so far was the whole protocols. And uh, again, we use Shamir secret sharing over Galo R rings and, uh, for the dot products. And afterwards, we translate the replicated sharing. And then everything can be done with a small number of dot products, lifting, and MSP extraction. So mm, nice optimized protocol. So now let's talk a little bit about uh, performance of our implementations. So first, of course, we implemented it on a CPU and did some benchmarks on AWS Periton 3 with uh, three parties which are uh, connected via local host network. And there you can see the dot products. We get a throughput of approximately 2 million dot products per second in this setting. And for the, the second part, for this MSP extraction, where we do this uh, threshold comparison, we get um, a throughput of, uh, of about 10 million uh, per second here. So combining for the whole protocol, the throughput that we can achieve in this setting is about 900,000 iris code comparisons per second, which is uh, already a huge improvement over this uh, Janus protocol that we, um, this uh, state of the art uh, protocol from the academic literature, but it's still not um, really enough to, to give a nice throughput for the work and infrastructure. So that's our, um, the reason why we also investigated uh, graphic card implementations for our protocol here. And uh, graphic cards are very nice for uh, computing something like dot products. And um, uh, first part of our protocol is actually a dot product. So we can get a huge uh, performance increase here as well. But uh, usually when we have um, this threshold comparison protocol uh, afterwards, after this dot product, there we have uh, a lot of communication around between the parties. So here the bottleneck is more network compared to just the computing power. And usually when you do MPC with uh, graphic cards, you always have this overhead of uh, moving data between the GPU and the CPU, which costs a lot of performance as well. But luckily there exists something like, uh, which is called NVIDIA NCCL. And with that, we can basically instruct the GPUs to directly access the network. And so we, in the end, were able to, to uh, implement the whole protocol just on the GPUs without ever moving data from the GPUs to the CPUs. So we, we, we um, don't have to deal with this uh, performance overhead. And so that the uh, setup was basically, we have a bunch of GPUs doing MPC with each other. And um, as I said, without this overhead of uh, data transfer on your system. And there we can get a huge speed up as well. So and um, we benchmark this on a very powerful AWS P P5 instances. So basically, each server had one, uh, each party had one of those P5 instances, uh, and therefore each party had access to eight H100 GPUs, and the network connection was uh, very fast uh, with 3.2 terabits per second. And there we can actually get uh, this huge throughput of uh, 2.4 billion iris codes comparisons per second. So this is definitely enough for the current workload for the work current infrastructure. All right, so this is basically everything about the protocol and also about the performance. And now I want to spend one slide now on um, uh, explaining why we use MPC in this use case and not homomorphic encryption, because this is something that the people kept asking us when we talked about this protocol. Why don't you use homomorphic encryption for this use case? So just as a disclaimer, you can use homomorphic encryption. It is uh, it's also possible to, to implement it uh, um, and to get the correct result. But the, the uh, unfortunate thing is with homomorphic encryption, you cannot get this uh, performance that we have here with MPC. So this uh, 2.4 billion iris code comparison per second is something that is definitely not uh, achievable with homomorphic encryption right now. 
So um, just as a comparison here, when you have a look at, uh, for example, Sama's DFHG library, the, the benchmarks they give on their website, they have a 16-bit integer addition of 100 milliseconds, and we would need definitely uh, more of those. Uh, and uh, you can easily see that the performance still does not scale. Also, one thing to consider when you have uh, homomorphic encryption is uh, something called ciphertext expansion. So when you, um, uh, so I did some small benchmarks when I want to encrypt one iris code, this actually has already the ciphertext size of uh, 37 megabytes. So when you have a database of uh, 6 billion uh, iris codes, you have to multiply this by 37 megabytes and you can see that the, the storage and RAM requirements actually also are significantly higher compared to, to, to the uh, MPC setting here. And finally, um, with MPC, what we have for the security here in the setting is that um, we, we require that we have uh, free computing parties which do not collude with each other, because if they collude, then they can reconstruct the original database. And with homomorphic encryption, this is also something where I cannot get rid of this non-collusion assumption in this use case here. Because the main point is that uh, the server who does the computation has no idea about the database. So this means when you have an encrypted database, so with homomorphic encryption encrypted database, there must be a key holder which is different from the database holder. And therefore, uh, if these two parties would collude, they could also reconstruct the database. So you cannot get rid with, uh, of this non-collusion assumption in this use case as well. So uh, no security advantage, we have a slower computation and more uh, database size expansion. So that uh, that's mainly the reasons why homomorphic encryption are not really uh, useful in this use case compared to MPC. So, all right, so we now come to the end of this presentation. So you have seen um, that uh, um, we get a very nice performance uh, in the end when we use GPUs. So the learnings here should be that uh, when you have an MPC protocol that you want to deploy in practice, you should actually also consider using GPUs for uh, improved throughput here. And another learning is that um, uh, even though MPC has been mostly of academic interest in the last decade or so, when we actually cleverly uh, optimize a protocol and use reasonably fast hardware, then MPC is actually also fast enough in practice for real world use cases with millions of users or other data sets um, of millions of users here. So uh, we, we, I'm very much looking forward to, to the next years to see many more MPC protocols be applied in practice here. So about this project here, so the, the, um, the, the status of uh, the, our collaboration with Bergkern right now is that uh, currently a predecessor of this protocol is deployed in practice. So basically where we just do the dot product on the shares, um, but uh, we also have done this uh, a prototype of this full protocol on the GPUs, as you've seen on the benchmarks. And uh, now this is in the, in the process of actually getting deployed in practice as well. So stay tuned for updates from uh, us or from WorkCoin. And if you're interested in more information about this protocol, you can have a look at the paper. It is online. Unfortunately, the optimization of the Gala rings is not yet present there because this is fairly new. But uh, regarding everything else, uh, you can find it in the paper. So thanks for your attention. I hope you have uh, learned something about this project. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask me right now. Thank you very much for the great presentation. And yeah, everyone feel free to ask questions in the chat or unmute yourself and ask questions. Let's wait, uh, wait one, two minutes for questions. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes, sure. Um, thank you for the presentation. It was really helpful. Also, as a general background on uh, on MPC, uh, I have one one technical question and one more general question. So, uh, you were comparing it with uh, this uh, previous uh, implementation that is like 
much slower in terms of uh, computation time. I'm wondering if the reason for this uh, slowness was because they weren't using uh, this uh, honest majority assumption. And in general, if you were to use this honest majority, would it be like, how how worse would, would it be? Um, so, so yeah, um, well, one reason, as I said, is um, they uh, uh, had a party setup so that their main similarities come from what they want to achieve in the end. So that they had the same fraction hemming distance. They also wanted to, to use the service as a deep application service so that the goal was the same. But uh, what they used to instantiate this protocol was completely different. So um, we had this free party <clears throat> setting with secret sharing, and they had actually a two party setting where they used a, a completely different kind of the C protocol, which is called garbage circuits. And um, they also then uh, were not able to use this, uh, um, this dot product optimization. And so that the main bottleneck in their setting was uh, really communication costs. So that the, the, the amount of uh, um, uh, information they had to share between these two parties to actually really uh, computation was significantly higher than in our approach. And that's the main reason why they, they were not successful with MPC in their, in their paper. So they also had an FFG implementation that was slightly faster than the MPC version, but also um, not comparable to what we achieved here. And yeah, um, the, to your second question, so uh, when you have this two-party setting without this dishonest majority, you, you cannot really get this, uh, this advantage that um, the dot product requires this reduced uh, communication amount. So there you always have to pay the, the, the cost of communicating linear in the bit size of the, the iris vectors. So you have at least this factor of 12,800 in there. So um, th this is um, the, the main reason why with a two-party setting, even if you use secret sharing, like the, the, as I said, the others uh, were using garbage circuits, but even if you use secret sharing, the communication would be significantly higher than what we have. So at least by a factor of 12,800. So um, that you can give you a rough overview of uh, how um, fast it would be in the two-party setting here without this honest majority assumption. Thanks. And uh, like the non-technical was about uh, one of the problem that you define as a, like uh, the origin of the paper that was like uh, this type of sensitive data shouldn't uh, exist in like a central uh, database for like a regulated reason. I'm wondering if there's any regulation that kind of mentioned the fact that if this uh, database is distributed, then it's okay. Yeah, so so that there that is actually a, a good question. So um, right now, I think the status is that uh, GDPR and similar don't like to have this, uh, don't like to see a database like this. And this is still not yet um, fully clear if uh, applying MPC and FHE is um, uh, actually then directly leads to something that has absolutely no problem with GDPR. This is something I think we need to, to, to see in the future, how the regulators will react to these uh, techniques. But uh, definitely, in my opinion, it's the, the, the correct thing to do, applying FHG, MPC, zero knowledge to gain privacy. But uh, I think there, there are too little um, practical applications so far to, to see how regulators actually react to, to um, in general, to this protocol. I think, uh, for the working setting they were talking to them and um, at least uh, some in Europe, uh, uh, at least the ones I know of, they were uh, okay with uh, using MPC here, but uh, uh, in general, I, I'm, I think it's not that uh, clear if um, any application of FHG MPC is directly um, uh, leads to something that is okay with regulators. But uh, uh, it's definitely the, the, the right step and uh, it's definitely something I, I encourage that you do. Um, but yeah, that we have to see in the next years. And I've seen in the chat, uh, Lucas has posted a paper, I think this is about the, uh, how GDPR interacts with MPC. Um, yeah, so maybe have a look at that. <laughs> Thank you. Any other question? 
Yes, I had one question. Uh, yes, I ahead. wanted to ask about since like the eventual identity of the user will be the iris code, right? Which is one to eight double zero bits, correct? I didn't fully get it. Um, can you repeat, so, please? So the eventual identity of a user is is one iris code, right? Yes. Yeah, so, so um, what happens is when you uh, when you sign up, uh, you get uh, the op takes an image of your iris and derives the iris code and the mask. Uh, and um, what you then uh, you have then to compare this iris code to the whole database. And what happens in practice is actually you have to do do eyes um, for this whole um, uh, setting. So basically, uh, the op scans both of your eyes, and then it is also some rotations of the eyes that get bashed against this database. But uh, essentially. Um, um, yeah, to do iris codes from the human, so you cannot uh, cheat by signing up with each of your eyes by one, um, each of your eyes once, and then you have to match uh, several versions of this iris code. So that is actually what is done in practice here. So that's why we need a little bit more throughput than uh, uh, just the, the database. So this is something we glance over in this presentation, but is uh, mentioned in the paper as well. Hope this answers the question. I did not really fully get it due to audio yeah. reasons, but uh, I hope this answers it. Yeah, yeah. No, thanks a lot. Yeah, I wanted to ask about uh, uh, since it's one to eight double zero bits. If if there's a system which is based on a unique identifier for users for around thirty two digits, so let's say one zero seven bits. So what what approach should uh, should the protocol build out should take for dealing with a 107 bits for uniquely identifying end users. I, I'm sorry, I, I really trouble understanding you. The audio is not that great. Can you maybe um, type the, the yeah. message in the chat, please? Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And the question is in the chat. Can you read it? Roman? Can you see it? Yes, I can yeah. read it. Um, yeah. So it's the question saying... is I want to ask if a system identifies end users with a unique idea of 32 digits, uh, 107 bits, what approach are available for this? So uh, I, I'm not sure if I fully understand the question, but. Uh, um, if in general, if you want to authenticate your users, there are uh, to a system there are several possibilities. For example, if you use your knowledge proofs for that, then uh, you also don't have to give away who you are, just that you are um, really um, uh, allowed to authenticate with the server. But uh, also with traditional systems where you give away your identity, is um, with DLS you also authenticate to a system. So basically, then the authentication key would be uh, your private key that the but. Uh, you, as I said, have to give away your identity, but with zero knowledge proofs in general, you can do this without uh, giving away your um, identity as well. So I don't know if that uh, answers your question. Yeah, you can ask in the you can ask in the PSC channel, and yeah, and Roman can answer. Yeah, yeah with more details. Have, yeah, yeah. have something. So I will follow up in the PSC chat. Thanks a lot. Thank you for the question. 
So yeah, if there are no more questions, we can wrap it up here. And thank you so much, Roman, for the great presentation. And it was really nice having you here. And thank you everyone for attending. And talk to you soon. Have a nice day. Thanks for having me. Um, bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.